The makers of epic pure sunflower oil, purine and pret cooking fat, yum yum peanut butter, maple margarine and niblet's cheese twists present the epic casebook. In which Inspector Carr investigates. Good evening. Regular listeners to the epic case book of crime will appreciate the important role played by the informer. Of course, nobody loves a man whose motives for supplying information stem not out of regard for law and justice, but are the purely mercenary ones expressed in rounds and cents. Sometimes, of course, an informer will squeal on his friends and one-time associates in order to achieve immunity from the consequences of his crimes. Whatever the reasons, the very mention of these people's names leaves a very nasty taste in the mouth. That's why the London police call them narks or squealers or grassers, all of them in terms of utter contempt. But there is another kind of informer, the type of person who seeks neither financial gain nor protection from his own misdeeds. The man who will shop another out of revenge. He is the sort of individual one has to treat with considerable caution since his information may be invented to create havoc in the life of someone he dislikes. That's why when I first received a warning telephone call, I treated it with a certain amount of suspicion. But it led to a strange episode in my life in the murder squad, an episode which I've called Warning Anonymous. The telephone call came through just as I was about to leave for home at approximately 5.30 one Friday afternoon. Car speaking. Ops here, sir. There's someone on the line. Says he wants to talk to you personally, sir. Says he's got a tip-off. Tip-off? Well, that's not my department. Put him through to X branch. Insists on speaking to you, sir. Says he knows you're the murder squad. Says it's a matter of life and death. Oh, there you see. Trying to trace the call, are you? Oh, yes, sir. Good. Well, I'll try and keep him talking. Put him through. Right, sir. You're going through. Speak up, please. Inspector Carr? Yes? Well, what can I do for you? Does the name of Gunner Kane mean anything to you? Gunner Kane? Should it? It was you that got him life. Fifteen years ago, it is. Oh, Gunner Kane, of course. Well, what about him? I just want to tell you he's out. He's going to kill the judge that sentenced him and the lawyer that double-crossed him. Why do you want to tell me all this? Oh, huh. Is he going to kill me, too? Ain't that enough? Oh, I see. You'll keep me talking. I'm speaking from a call box. I'm leaving now. Tell your blokes I need bother looking for fingerprints on this telephone. There won't be none. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, just a minute. Uh, he's hung up. Yes? That call came from a telephone box in Leicester Square. Leicester Square Station, sir. Car's on its way. Well, I radio them not to bother. He's rung off. Right, sir. Uh, there is something else you can do for me? Yes, sir. I want you to get me all you can on the Gunner Kane case. Right, sir. Some time ago, I was a sergeant at the time. He shot and killed a constable. I helped to get him convicted. Life. He was a lucky man. Lucky, Inspector. Life, sir. Very lucky. The government suspended capital punishment for a time. Well, now he's coming out of jail. All oh, this is very interesting. Uh, do you know what they called the case at the time, Ops? No, sir. Well, of course you don't. Why should you? It's a long time ago. They called it the case of the undiscovered loot. There was over a hundred thousand pounds in one pound notes. No one knows what happened to him, including Gunner, if he was to be believed. I give anything to know who that informer was, telling me Gunner's out and he's about to kill the man who defended him. All oh, a bit strange. Obviously, the undiscovered stolen money has something to do with the call. (laughs) 
Carl speaking. Up's here again, sir. You wanted Mr. Bailey. We've got him on the line, sir. Speak up, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bailey, uh, my name's Carr, Inspector Carr. Do you remember me? Oh, yes, of course. Haven't seen you in years. How are you, Inspector? Fine. How are you? I'm all right. There's a note in your voice. Shouldn't I be? Remember Gunner Kane? What? What do you say? What about Kane? Came out of Parkhurst Jail this morning. No. But he was up for life. It's a minimum of 20 years. He's not due out for another five. That's what I thought. As a result of a telephone call, I've been making inquiries. There was a riot in the jail. He saved the governor's life, got a five-year remission. He's out all right. So why wasn't I warned? Now, this is... Why this... are you so worried, what? Mr. Bailey? You defended him, remember? Have you forgotten? You presented the case for the police? Surely you must have read of the... Of the marriage. Marriage? Yes. I married his wife, Sheila. Oh, you did, did you? How long ago was that? It's over 13 years ago. Took me over an hour to trace you, Mr. Bailey. I see you're no longer practicing law. No. I've been running this hotel for the last 10 years. And I shall, I, I shall have to demand police protection. Why? Because you married his wife? She divorced him, didn't she? You don't understand. I knew Gunner better than anybody. I defended him, didn't I? He's a killer. A vicious swine that'll stop at nothing. Come to think of it, Inspector Carr... You, you're the murder squad. Why have you contacted me? What's it all about? Somebody phoned the yard to tell us that Gunner is out of jail and was about to live up to his nickname. He is gunning for you. Now listen, listen, Inspector. You've got to help me. Who, who was it that telephoned? I don't know. Could have been Gunner himself. But if I were you, I wouldn't go out alone at night, keep your windows locked. After all, he has got a motive for revenge... It could be two things. A hundred thousand smackers or a wife. Call's outside, Inspector. I still don't know why you haven't pulled Gunner in. No, because it isn't necessary. A man that kills a policeman doesn't just walk out of the prison gates, sniff the free air, and is allowed to go his own way... No, he's been tailed ever since the prison gate shot on him. He's been warned I'm coming to see him. Oh, I suppose I should have baked you a cake, knowing that Sergeant Carr was paying me a visit. Inspector, now, Gunner, it's been a long time. You, <laughs> you talk about a long time. How long do you think it is in a jail? If you think I feel sorry for you, think again. You shot and killed P.C. Ballantyne. You're a lucky man you're not in a wooden box. So what do you want? Revenge? Because I shot a fellow policeman? I've done my time, and I? Yeah, you've done your time. You served your punishment. But tell me you showed a lot of guts. Saved the governor's life. No black marks. Full remission of sentence, including an additional five. So what? But what are you really after? The hundred thousand? No one ever did find it, did they? Quite true. There's a small matter of a hundred thousand quid unaccounted for. So I heard in jail. Don't think that I was surprised when they flatly shattered me all day. Now you come to see me. Oh, save your breath. I don't know where the money is. Except... Mm hmm? Well, except that double-crossing Bailey. He stole my wife. How do I know he didn't take the loot? So you don't know where the loot is? Every few months, if it isn't a cop or an insurance bloke. I keep telling everyone I don't know. That's what was killing me, stuck in jail for all those years. For doing a job and then not getting a nickel out of it. You were stuck in jail for killing a police Yes, I know. I'm... Lucky, I suppose, I didn't swing. Everybody keeps telling me that. Sure, I'm lucky. But I, I didn't mean to kill him, you know that. Let's not go over that again. You shot a constable to evade arrest. That's murder. Yes, I know. Well, I learned me lesson, didn't I? You'll never get me inside again. I'm going straight. What are you going to do to Bailey? Why'd you ask that? Has he got the money? If he has, I'll kill him, so help me, I'll kill him. That's what somebody told me you were going to do. Kill Bailey. Where were you at about 5.30 yesterday? Now, oh, come off it, Inspector. There was two flat feet standing right beside me when I had my first whiskey in the Holland Arms. Why did you threaten to kill Bailey? Did I? Oh, I suppose I might have done that again inside, wondering. About what? Your wife or the hundred thousand? Oh, I can keep Sheila. Anyway, I couldn't blame her knowing I was going inside for life. Fifteen years a long time. 
I'm enough to cool off any woman. So it is the hundred thousand. I don't know. If he didn't take it, who did? There were only the two of you involved in the robbery. You and young Stocky Swanson. He was killed. And Bailey. He wasn't in on the snatch, but he talked to Stocky before the youngster died. If you're after the hundred thousand, it's no good coming to me. So am I. I don't know where it is, but I'm me to find out. At the moment, I'm not after anything in particular. I'd like to wrap up the case that started 15 years ago. But, Gunner, I'd rather prevent murder than punish the murderer. Get the idea? Be your age, Carr. Do you think I want to go back inside? Or swing? They brought capital punishment back, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know. Let's go over the day you did the snatch. You handled the hundred thousand, didn't you? Yeah. Everything was going fine. If it hadn't been... I know. If you say you haven't got the money, and I don't think you have, who took it? Well, you you know how it was. Look at it. The Bow Industrial Township. Mile after mile of smoking factories. Oh, our factories need wages, and we're carrying hundred thousand pounds worth. That's what gives us our job. Without these factories, I wouldn't want the services of Stronghold Transport Limited. Oh, we're due there in ten minutes. Uh, only another mile to go. What? What, what has happened? You just stay where you are if you know what's good for you. All right, Stocky, take their keys. Come on, hurry. My mate, what's happened with my mate? He'll live. Now, don't move. You've only got a few scratches. Here you are. I've got it. Right. Let's get in the car and scram. Hey, what's going on here? Come on, start up the car. Get out of the way, you fool. Ah! the swag. This car's hot. Look, we'll put the money there. We'll dig a hole by that tree. Now get back on the main road and then ditch the car. Well, let's hope we don't forget where we put that hundred thousand swaggers. It's hot money for wage packets. Neither of us will go near that spot for six months. We'll grab it and skip the country. Me, Sheila and you. Okay, kid? Okay. Hey! Look in the mirror. He's been tailed. Step on it, then. I'm going as fast as I can. There's a cop car in front, too. Get off the road, you fool. Get off the road. Uh, Jump the curb. Inspector Carr. The kid died in hospital and I went up for life. Yes, I know. You after the judge. But me? The judge? What for? That's what we were tipped off. I'll tell you straight, Inspector. There was only three people who knew where we had the money. Stocky, me, and I told me wife, Sheila. When she got there, the money had gone, so she said. Then she marries the guy that's supposed to defend me. I'll tell you this, if I find that they took the money, I'll do them both. I swear it. I'm warning you now in advance. I don't believe they did double-cross you. You know he was struck off the rolls about two years after you went inside. They run a second-rate hotel in Croydon. If they'd got the money, all they had to do was to skip the country and live in luxury for the rest of their lives. Well, that's all very well. The way I hit that money, nobody could have found it accidentally. Yet there is someone else. Who sent that mysterious phone call? That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> My need for this knowledge became acute less than an hour after my talk with Gunner Kane. Yes? Operations here, Inspector. Oh, what is it this time? Bailey, sir. Gunner Kane case. Found shot. Bullet through his head. Gunner Kane's been picked up, sir. You don't say. Where's he being held? Croydon, sir. Right. I'll be right over. <laughs> I 
I didn't do it, Inspector. I swear Where's I... Where's Mrs. Bailey? Uh, I can tell you that, sir. Uh, as soon as she heard that the gunner was out, she panicked and went and stayed with her sister in Dublin. She's there now. Made a statement to the Dublin CID less than ten minutes ago. Oh, that clears her. What's the story? No, no, you speak first, Kane. How did you come to be picked up? I've been framed. It's a dirty police trick. They still believe I've got the money. Oh, cut all the nonsense. What happened? Well, about an hour ago, I get a telephone call. Some geezer, he says to me. Gunner Kane, I've been trying to trace you for a long time. You go along to Bailey tonight. You'll learn all about the hundred thousand quid. How do you know? Who are you? Never you mind. You're not going to let him get away with it, are you? You don't want poor old Stucky Swanson to die for nothing, do you? Men in general hemorrhage ain't a pleasant death, you know. He'd have wanted you What are you saying? Who are you? I'm saying that if you get to Bailey's house exactly nine o'clock tonight... I'll see to it that you get your hundred thousand. See you later. 28 Park Road, Croydon. Hello. Uh, hello. And so you went to 28 Park Road, Croydon, did you? Yes, I did. It's only about 30 yards away from the hotel they managed. There's a light on in the porch. I goes through. Front door's open. And I hear a shot. Well, I didn't know what to do for a moment. I mean, I rushes into the sitting room. No one there. Looks in the bedroom. There's Ernie Bailey with a bullet through his head. Gun on the floor. I was about to run out and a couple of digs nabbed me. The doctor looked at the body. Yes, sir. He'd been killed within a matter of minutes of arresting Kane. The gun had its number filed off. It was odd, all right. The sort of gun you use, eh, Gunner? Nah, I must have been mad to fall for a telephone call. Look, I didn't do it, Inspector. We've uh, taken a quick powder test, Inspector, but it looks very much like the gunner's fingerprint on the gun. I know, I know. I kept telling them before you arrived. I, I picked the gun up. I was in a daze. Then I dropped it again. You there. Were you telling Ken? Yes, sir. We uh, we saw him go into the house. We heard the pistol shot and rushed and arrested him. Gunner, you killed a policeman. And I see no reason to go out of my way to protect you. They'll have to pull you in on circumstantial evidence. Maybe you'll be safer inside. We'll hold you for questioning. That means you'll have the usual privileges. When I find the killer, we'll set you free. But, uh, Inspector, you, you mean to say that... I've said what I have to say. All right, take him away. Jackson, you come back to the yard with me. As the worthy Jackson and I drove in the police car, I kept dwelling on the anonymous call I'd received. But what about Gunner Kane's story? Could have made the whole thing up, of course. It could be... But all the factors suggested otherwise. Back at the yard, I used our vast and highly efficient machine to turn back the clock. I want you to take careful note of the Dossier X branches prepared for us. Right, sir. And I want to know the hospital Stocky Swanson went to, who attended him, everything. Very good, sir. My compliments to Inspector Wilson. I want this to be made top priority operation. Right, sir. I want to be informed as soon as you get something definite, whether it's day or night... It'll be done, sir. Good. Jump to it. The most exciting moments for a detective are when he knows instinctively that he's on the right trail. But from then on, it's a matter of patience, time, and success. Yes? Operations here, Inspector. Got what you wanted, sir. Good man. We've got the admittance card when young Swanson was admitted to the Bow District General Hospital. He arrived at 12.20 p.m. and died at 2.30 a.m. the following morning. The people who attended him are Dr. Alfred Passful and Nurse Margaret Nancy. Yes, well, I'm, I'm retired now, but of course I, I, I remember it. It isn't often one gets mixed up in a highway robbery and murder case. Was he conscious when you attended him? No, 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 he was not. No, I gave him some X-14, uh, that cerebral wound caused by the accident. He remained conscious or semi-conscious until he died the following morning. Uh, they telephoned to tell me he was dead about uh, half past two. The duty surgeon certified him dead. The night orderly told me the patient was in a very bad way. By the time I got to him, he was practically gone. We had anticipated it, of course. It was only a question of time. At 
And so it went on and on. Not an easy task, trying to trace all those who were connected with the admittance of a young bandit, however remotely. Then came the search for the orderly, who was on duty at the hospital that fatal night. He was now a middle-aged man living in the highly respectable town of Leamington Spa. As the police car sped through the lodge gates along the avenue of trees to come to a stop outside the type of dwelling known as a country gentleman's residence, I knew that my investigations were drawing to a close. Mr. Collins, you were at one time a hospital orderly at the Bow District General Hospital. Yes, it's a long time ago. Why do you ask me? Long time ago or not, you were the night orderly that called the duty surgeon to the dying Swanson. Swanson, was he? I don't remember anyone called Swanson. Come, come, Mr. Collins, one of the most dramatic hold-ups ever known in British criminal history. There you were by the bedside of this young bandit and you don't remember. Oh, yes, I do remember something about it now. That's better. Well, let me jog your memory a little further, Mr. Collins. As a male nurse... It was your duty to keep an hourly log as to the condition of the patient brought in on an emergency. Oh, yes. Well, I've got your log with me. It says 12.30 a.m. Gave patient half a gram of X-14 as prescribed. Patient delirious. Do you remember him being delirious, Mr. Collins? Well, that can I. 15 years ago. If I write that on the hospital log report, then it was, sir. I noticed that some four weeks after this occurrence, you resigned from the hospital. Yeah, that's right. Mr. Collins, we've been checking up on you pretty thoroughly, and despite your undoubted affluence, we can't trace your means of support. You can't? I don't know what you're getting at. I'm one of the major shareholders in Leamington Engineering Works. I own all the land on the bluff. I don't know what you mean when you say you can't trace my... I'm sorry if I've not made myself clear. You were a penniless young hospital nurse, and yet you found it possible to give up your employment in great comfort. Why did you warn me that Cain might kill Bailey? I don't know what you mean, me warn you. You said that now that Cain was out, he would go gunning for the judge and Bailey. Why? Why did you? Come on, don't stall. On the very day he left... I didn't telephone anybody. Who said anything about telephone? How did you know I was telephoned? But since I'm here, I'll do a bit of telephoning. Number, please. Inspector Carr here. I want to know whether anybody put through a trunk call on the 21st to Stepney 8654. Very good, sir. Phone me back here, will you? Right, it won't take long. Well, I did uh, telephone London. I, uh, well, I wanted to inquire about, uh, well, I heard that this fellow Kane had, uh, well, he come out of jail. That was a very careless thing to do. Why should you be interested in Gunner Kane? Well, uh, well, he was involved, wasn't he? Did you go up to London that day? No. Collins, you're a fool. The station master saw you. He caught the 3.45 p.m. to London. Up. Oh. Don't move, Collins. Hello? Inspector Carr? Yes, there was a telephone call from the number you're speaking at. That's all I want to know. Where'd you get the gun from? What gun? The gun you shot Bailey with. You're mad, I didn't. Albert Collins, I arrest you on a charge of murdering Ernest Bailey. I don't mind telling you, Inspector. I thought I was a goner. Bloke with my reputation with me fingerprint on a pistol and Bailey lying stiff at me feet. You're lucky that Collins made one or two silly mistakes, such as mentioning a telephone call. When how would he have known how I was warned about you? I believe he's pleading guilty. What else could he do? You see, all those years ago, when we were looking for the stolen money, no one dreamt that the clue lay in a general hospital. Bailey used his brains. He knew that if his wife wasn't lying, someone else must have known about the hundred thousand pounds, where it was hidden. But who could it be? The money was hidden on the spur of the moment, not many minutes before you and Swanson crashed the car. Well, you were shaken, all right, but compass meant his. Swanson caught his head on the steering wheel, badly hurt. Bailey worked it out that it must have been somebody at the hospital. He traced the orderly, began to blackmail him. Collins reasoned, if ever Bailey told you what happened to the money, the ex-hospital nurse's life would be a short one. That's why he hit on the scheme of getting rid of both of you by telephoning me that you were out and threatening Bailey's life, and then telephoning you so that you'd be near the scene of the crime when he shoots Bailey. He knew we'd have you tailed, and as soon as the shot was heard, my boys would rush in and arrest you. It's funny that I never thought of the hospital before. Would have saved Bailey's life. Uh, what put you onto the orderly this time, Governor? Oh, it's quite simple, really. You see. 
Well, what was the clue that led me to the hospital where Stocky Swanson was admitted so many years ago and then to the killer of Bailey? Well, if you remember the mysterious voice telephoning Kane in order to incriminate him in the murder he didn't commit, said, Never you mind. You're not going to let him get away with it, are you? You don't want poor old Stucky Swanson to die for nothing, do you? Men in jail hemorrhage isn't a pleasant death, you know. That was his undoing. He talks of young Swanson's injuries 15 years ago and uses a phrase like men in jail hemorrhage. It had to be somebody who not only was at the hospital at the time, but someone directly acquainted with medical terms. The moral of the story, never hide stolen loot in a hospital. It'll go to your head. Good night. Tell your blokes I need bother looking for fingerprints on this telephone. There won't be none. <laughs> Goodbye. No, just a minute. Uh, he's hung up. Yes? That call came from a telephone box in Leicester Square. Leicester Square Station, sir. Car's on its way. Well, I radio them not to bother. He's rung off. Right, sir. Uh, there is something else you can do for me? Yes, sir. I want you to get me all you can on the gunner cane case. Right, Some time ago, I was a sergeant at the time. He shot and killed a constable. I helped to get him convicted. Life. He was a lucky man. Lucky, Inspector. Life, sir. Very lucky. The government suspended capital punishment for a time. Well, now he's coming out of jail. All oh, this is very interesting. Uh, do you know what they called the case at the time, Ops? No, sir. Well, of course you don't. Why should you? It's a long time ago. They called it the case of the undiscovered loot. There was over a hundred thousand pounds in one pound notes. No one knows what happened to him, including Gunner, if he was to be believed. I'd give anything to know who that informer was, telling me Gunner's out and he's about to kill the man who defended him. It's all a bit strange. Obviously, the undiscovered stolen money has something to do with the call. Car speaking. Ops here again, sir. You wanted Mr. Bailey. We've got him on the line, sir. Speak up, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bailey, uh, my name's Carr, Inspector Carr. Do you remember me? Oh, yes, of course. Haven't seen you in years. How are you? When I first received a warning telephone call, I treated it with a certain amount of suspicion. But it led to a strange episode in my life in the murder squad. An episode which I've called Warning Anonymous. The telephone call came through just as I was about to leave for home at approximately 5.30 one Friday afternoon. Car speaking. Ops here, sir. There's someone on the line. Says he wants to talk to you personally, sir. Says he's got a tip-off. Tip-off? Well, that's not my department. Put him through to X-Branch. Insists on speaking to you, sir. Says he knows you're the murder squad. Says it's a matter of life and death. Oh, there is, is he? Trying to trace the call, are you? Oh, yes, sir. Good. Well, I'll try and keep him talking. Put him through. Right, sir. You're going through. Speak up, please. Inspector Carr? Yes? Well, what can I do for you? Does the name of Gunner Kane mean anything to you? Gunner Kane? Should it? It was you that got him life. Fifteen years ago, it is. Oh, Gunner Kane, of course. Well, what about him? I just want to tell you he's out. He's going to kill the judge that sentenced him and the lawyer that double-crossed him. Why do you want to tell me all this? Huh. Is he going to kill me, too? Ain't that enough? Oh, I see. You'll keep me talking. I'm speaking from a call box. I'm leaving, Inspector. Fine. How are you? I'm all right. There's a note in your voice. Shouldn't I be? Remember Gunner Kane? What? What did you say? What about Kane? Came out of Parkhurst jail this morning. No. But he was up for life. It's a minimum of 20 years. 
We should not do out for another five. That's what I thought. As a result of a telephone call, I've been making inquiries. There was a riot in the jail. He saved the governor's life, got a five-year remission. He's out all right. Yes, but why wasn't I warned? Now, this is... Why this... are you so worried, what? Mr. Bailey? You defended him, remember? Have you forgotten? You presented the case for the police? Surely you must have read of the... Of the marriage. Married? Yes. I married his wife, Sheila. Oh, you did, did you? How long ago was that? It's over 13 years ago. It took me over an hour to trace you, Mr. Bailey. I see you're no longer practicing law. No. I've been running this hotel for the last ten years. You know, I shall have to demand police protection. Why? Because you married his wife? She divorced him, didn't she? You don't understand. I knew Gunner better than anybody. I defended him, didn't I? He's a killer. A vicious swine that'll stop at nothing. Come to think of it, Inspector Carr, you, you're the murder squad. Why have you contacted me? What's it all about? Somebody phoned the yard to tell us that Gunner is out of jail and was about to live up to his nickname. He is gunning for you. Now listen. Listen, Inspector. You've got to help me. Who? Who was it that telephoned? I don't know. Could have been Gunner himself. But if I were you, I wouldn't go out alone at night, keep your windows locked. After all, he has got a motive for revenge. It could be two things. A hundred thousand smackers or a wife. Call's outside, Inspector. I still don't know why you haven't pulled Gunner in. No, because it isn't necessary. A man that kills a policeman doesn't just walk out of the prison gates, sniff the free air, and is allowed to go his own way. No, he's been tailed ever since the prison gates shut on him. He's been warned I'm coming to see him. Oh, I suppose I should have baked you a cake, knowing that Sergeant Carr was paying me a visit. Inspector, now, Gunner, it's been a long time. You, <laughs> you talk about a long time. How long do you think it is in a jail? If you think I feel sorry for you, think again. You shot and killed P.C. Ballantyne. You're a lucky man. You're not in a wooden box. So what do you want? Revenge? Because I shot a fellow policeman? I've done my time, and I? Yeah, you've done your time. You served your punishment. But tell me you showed a lot of guts. Saved the governor's life. No black marks. Full remission of sentence, including an additional five. So what? But what are you really after? The hundred thousand? No one ever did find it, did they? Quite true. There's a small matter of a hundred thousand quid unaccounted for. So I heard in jail. Don't think that I was surprised when the flatly shattered me all day. Now you come to see me. Oh, save your breath. I don't know where the money is. Except... Hmm? Well, except that double-crossing Bailey. He stole my wife. How do I know he didn't take the loot? So you don't know where the loot is? Every few months, if it isn't a co... The makers of epic pure sunflower oil, purine and pret cooking fat, yum yum peanut butter, maple margarine and niblet's cheese twists present the epic case book. In which Inspector Carr investigates. Good evening. Regular listeners to the epic case book of crime will appreciate the important role played by the informer. Of course, nobody loves a man whose motives for supplying information stem not out of regard for law and justice, but are the purely mercenary ones expressed in rounds and cents. Sometimes, of course, an informer will squeal on his friends and one-time associates in order to achieve immunity from the consequences of his crimes. Whatever the reasons, the very mention of these people's names leaves a very nasty taste in the mouth. That's why the London police call them narks or squealers or grassers, all of them terms of utter contempt. But there is another kind of informer, the type of person who seeks neither financial gain nor protection from his own misdeeds. The man who will shop another out of revenge. He is the sort of individual one has to treat with considerable caution since his information may be invented to create havoc in the life of someone he dislikes. That's why 